The land of Israel is where everything starts. And when I say everything, I mean it. The Jewish people and Christians and Muslims, they all feel strongly attached to this piece of land that is also the source of an ongoing conflict because everybody wants to exercise ownership. The basic cause of the conflict is a sustained occupation of other people's land by the Israelis. The heart of the conflict was never about land. The heart of the conflict was never about water. The heart of the conflict was never about black oil. The conflict is not about borders. If it were about borders, it would have been solved a long time ago because the Palestinian Authority has been offered up to 97% of the land in the West Bank in exchange for peace, and it has turned it down. I believe that the Arab-Israeli conflict today is a manufactured conflict. We meet at a time of great tension. America's strong bonds with Israel are well known. This bond is unbreakable. It is also undeniable that the Palestinian people, Muslims and Christians, has suffered in pursuit of a homeland. For more than 60 years, they've endured the pain of dislocation. Many wait in refugee camps in the West Bank, Gaza, and neighboring lands for a life of peace and security that they have never been able to lead. They endure the daily humiliations, large and small, that come with occupation. The situation for the Palestinian people is intolerable, and America will not turn our backs on the legitimate Palestinian aspiration for dignity, opportunity, and a state of their own. But if we see this conflict only from one side or the other, then we will be blind to the truth. such as underground launch silos that have fired thousands of rockets on Israeli civilians over the last few years. Our enemy is not the Palestinian people. We will do the utmost to make sure that we do not hurt or injure anyone who is not a part of the Hamas terrorist organization. December 2008. Israel appeared to attack the Gaza Strip seemingly without cause. The world reacted with demonstrations demanding Israel to end the violence and free the Palestinian people. With shouts of Zionism is racism and apartheid, the world accused Israel of oppressing and killing innocent civilians for no reason. We evacuated every last inch of the Gaza Strip. We uprooted tens of settlements and evicted thousands of Israelis from their home. And in response, we received a hail of missiles on our cities, towns, and children. The claim that territorial withdrawals will bring peace with the, with the Palestinians, or at least advance peace, has until now not stood the test of reality. That's stupid idea that we can exchange 
land for peace, I don't understand that. What does that mean? That means that for them, what's important is land. And for us, it's peace. It means that after we exchange and they got the land, then they don't need anything more and we still need the peace. Who, we do, who do we do it with if they have the land? So, I mean, peace for peace, I can understand. Land for peace, what is this? If, if there was ever uh, a question about whether land for peace was an issue, it was proved very clearly in 2005 when Israel withdrew completely from the Gaza Strip. A few years ago, Israel decided to leave Gaza. They dragged their people out of Gaza and finally made Gaza Jew-free. So the Arabs would live without looking at one Jew. And what happened? Was Israel thanked for leaving the Gaza Strip? No. What happened was Hamas came in, uh, every infrastructure that was there, including greenhouses, including the agricultural industry that existed, was destroyed just because it had been Israeli. And we, what did we see? We saw a, a fundamental Islamist state uh, rise uh, in, in Gaza, and not only rise because they could form whatever state they wanted, but the, the whole aim of that state was to destroy Israel. The response of the Arabs of West Bank and Gaza was not to improve their lives and make a, a Hong Kong out of Gaza, start improving the lives of their children, education. No. What they did was roll their missiles, roll their katushas to the border of Israel and tell Israel, you're wrong for pulling out. As soon as Israel left Gaza, the rockets started firing towards Sderot, towards, towards Israel. So obviously they gave the land and they've never seen the peace. The terror became so uh, relentless, thousands, I think four or five thousand rockets have been fired from Gaza into the south of Israel, our population centers, since Israel uprooted our Jewish communities there and withdrew all our military forces there in response to the demand of the Palestinians and the international community to help encourage the establishment of some sort of independence for the Palestinians. And that proves one thing. The seriousness of the claims of the Arabs that the problem is pulling out of the West Bank and Gaza. In 1947, when the United Nations proposed the partition plan of a Jewish state and an Arab state, the entire Arab world rejected the resolution, whereas the Jewish community, by contrast, welcomed it by dancing and rejoicing. The Arabs rejected any Jewish state in any borders. Those who think that the continued enmity towards Israel is a product of our presence in Judea, Samaria, and Gaza is confusing cause and consequence. After World War I, the victorious allies began breaking up the defeated nations. The former Ottoman Empire was to be divided up, the region of Palestine for the Jews and Mesopotamia for the Arab nations. However, because of a growing resentment towards a Jewish presence in the area, things began to change. In 1922, Great Britain, unilaterally on its own accord, without international sanction, broke off 70% of what was the Palestine mandate given to them to promote close Jewish settlement, the creation of a national home for the Jewish people in Palestine. They broke off 70% of that territory, the eastern half on the other side of the Jordan River, to create a protectorate they called Transjordan. Anti-Semitism around the globe was increasing and the Middle East was no different. By the end of the Second World War, Transjordan would become the Kingdom of Jordan, an Arab state. Yet the world was still open to the idea of a Jewish homeland. In 1947, 
the United Nations at a time when colonial empires all over the world in the wake of World War II were crumbling, recognized that the Jewish people had a deep, enduring, historic right to this land, Eretz Israel, the land of Israel. However, because of intense opposition from the Arab nations, the UN sought to appease them by altering the partition plan further. In 1947, that partition plan suggested, let's take that western part of Palestine and let's divide it. We're going to give a Jewish home, we're going to give a state, a home to the Jews to be an independent state, and we're going to give another part of that Palestinian mandate to the Arabs who at this point live there. It doesn't matter whether they've been there for one generation, two generations or more, they hadn't been there for much more than that, the vast majority of them, but they deserve also some autonomy, independence, what have you. Let's divide it into two states. That's what was in vogue then. We should emphasize that at the time, both the United States and the Soviet Union, the two great powers, voted for a partition where there'd be a compromise, where there'd be a land, they didn't use the word, pa Palestinians at the time were both Jews and uh, Arabs. There'd be a land for Arabs, and be, there'd be a land for Jews, and there'd be an internationalized Jerusalem. When that partition was passed, there was joy in the Jewish part of Jerusalem, and there was not just mourning, but anger and threats and cries for revenge in the Arab parts of Jerusalem and throughout the Arab world. Israel accepted the partition. We weren't happy about it, but we didn't want to have war, and we figured we would take the little bit that they were offering us. The, the Arab side never, never accepted it, and in fact went to war. Seven Arab states went to war against Israel. The Israel exists today and is recognized today not because of the UN decision, but because uh, the world recognized our Declaration of Independence. After the declaration of the state on May 14, 1948, five Arab countries aggressively invaded what was designated as the Jewish areas of the state and the newly formed State of Israel and the newly created IDF, Israel Defense Forces, were forced to defend themselves. Britain had left the region and seemingly left the new Jewish state unprotected. Seizing the opportunity, Egypt, Jordan, Iraq, Syria and Lebanon, with support and help from the other Arab nations attacked intending to remove every trace of a Jewish state. Yet the new nation fought back. Over the period of the war, we were successful, and we managed to enlarge the area that was allocated under the UN plan and beat back the Arab aggressors. After 1948, uh, it's uh, really interesting. I mean, we all know about the Palestinian refugees, and uh, we think that roughly you know, we don't have an exact count, but roughly 800,000 Palestinians were displaced. But at the same time, that they were virtually the same time as they were pushed out of or left their homes uh, in what is now Israel, uh, the Jewish population in Iraq, North Africa, Yemen, Aden, to some extent Egypt, Libya, uh, which amounted to almost a million Jews, something that we forget, um, began to suffer uh, increasing discrimination and violence, some of it related to the Israel-Palestine issue. Arabs from Palestine were displaced due to the Arab-Israeli war. Yet Jews throughout the Middle East began facing intense persecution and ultimately became refugees themselves. The bottom line was that a number of Jews, roughly equivalent to the number of Palestinian Arabs, ended up leaving their homes, leaving their countries, abandoning everything. There was nothing they could bring with them. They weren't allowed. Uh, and um, 
the large majority of them ended up in Israel. Nearly one million Jews were forced to flee their homes in Arab countries. With nowhere else to turn, Israel seemed their only option. However, the new nation was not prepared to absorb so many in such a short time. Certainly they had lost their possessions, they were no longer in their homes, but they were assisted uh, either generously or less generously, but they were able to make new lives for themselves. Unfortunately, the refugees from Arab lands, uh, uh, the Palestinian refugees rather, did not get the same treatment, and they were not welcomed. Here we are in 2009, and they are still living in refugee camps, uh, although they're not exactly camps in the same way that we might think of them. I mean, they're not tent camps for the most part. They're towns, but they're living in misery and essentially have little way out and have become very embittered uh, over this, and yet, you know, that could have been solved. Was it the duty of Arab countries to solve it? I don't know. It depends how you feel about other human beings, I think. Arab League policy is to keep the Arabs of the West Bank and Gaza in a permanent refugee status. This is the Arab League policy. If a Palestinian lives in uh, Cairo or in uh, Syria, in Damascus, they never get the Egyptian nationality or the Syrian nationality or whatever Arab country nationality. Why is that? This is dictated by the Arab League because they want to keep Palestinians as refugees forever. So a Palestinian could be born and live and die in Egypt or Syria and never get the Egyptian nationality or the Syrian nationality. I wouldn't say it was a cultural thing, and I, uh, I just don't think so. I mean, uh, I think it really was a political issue, and I think that um, you know they were a convenient tool. It's um, a um, whip with which to beat uh, Israel, and um, they continue to be that. This proves that the. Arab world doesn't want to solve the refugee problem because if the refugee problem is solved, there is no problem. You'll always hear the international community, especially United Nations people, uh, the Secretary General of the United Nations, whoever he is at the time, will always repeat a certain sentence which is Israel must withdraw to the lines of June 4th 1967 and you've heard that a million times I'm sure and what's so important about June 4th 1967 that's where the borders were the night before on June 5th the morning of June 5th 1967 Israel struck first started a six-day war that changed all the borders around Israel and because we struck first under the international law we're the aggressor which means any territories we took are occupied territories the Six-Day War is a defining moment in the conflict. The Arab world was growing increasingly impatient with the Jewish presence in what was supposed to be Arab Islamic land. Hate-filled rhetoric filled the airwaves of the Middle East, even during the 1950s and 60s. During this time, no voice was louder than that of Egyptian President Gamal Abdel Nasser. In 1967, the president of Egypt at the time, President Nasser, decided to close the Straits of Tehran, which is an international waterway. A waterway that is a lifeblood for Israel, bringing valuable supplies, food, etc. And he closed it to one nation only, ships bearing the Israeli flag and ships bringing in goods to Israel. This is illegal under international law and is a casus belli, a cause for war. Israel was perfectly within its rights when it chose to respond and to reopen those straits by force. The Egyptian president, Gamal Abdul Nasser, uh, is at the time basically considered the leader of the Arab world. And he's very outspoken, very brazen in his speeches, and he gets the people wild with excitement. Uh, and he basically insinuates 
his intentions towards the state of Israel. And then he starts putting military forces into the Sinai Desert, which he's not supposed to do. It's a demilitarized zone. There's a United Nations peacekeeping force that's there to make sure he doesn't put forces into the Sinai Desert, and he still puts them in. And then he informs the, the United Nations peacekeeping force that they need to leave. Nasser kicked the United Nations Emergency Forces, the UN peacekeeping troops who were placed in Sinai to prevent any sort of conflict out of the Sinai, and he started massing his own troops within Sinai. Israel was on the defensive. At any time, masses of Egyptian troops could pour over the border and overrun the state of Israel. Things looked very bad. Tensions were high. The joke in Israel at the time was, Guys, the last one out of here, make sure you switch out the lights. They really didn't think that they'd make it. Our intelligence at the time was pretty good, and we find out that there's several hundred aircrafts of several Arab air forces, Jordanian, Syrian, Egyptian, Iraqi, uh, in several airstrips in those respective countries, and that they're basically planning an attack against Israel. We had little choice but to take preemptive steps. Israel decided that it had no choice but to do so, we launched a raid against uh, Egyptian airfields and we were very successful in wiping out the whole of the Egyptian Air Force within a number of hours. In one massive preemptive raid, Israel destroyed the Arab Air Forces under the command of Egypt, giving Israel air superiority. However, Egypt was not the only one planning on attacking the Jewish nation. Syria and Jordan were also working with Egypt and had been preparing to invade as well. Israel had gone to great pains to make clear to the Jordanians that we have no intentions of fighting them. Remember, the Jordanians are in control of Jude what we call today Judea, Samaria, the Jordan Valley, and East Jerusalem, including the old city of Jerusalem, which is obviously very important to the uh, Israelis and the Jews worldwide, because that's where the Temple Mount is, that's where the Western Wall is. And uh, Israel had sent message after message to the Jordanians, don't fight. Uh, we're not interested in fighting with you. So it's a matter of clear, established uh, historical fact that Israel in the first days of the war with Egypt sent a, uh, a message to Jordan saying, we don't want war with you, uh, we are not attacking you, we have, a, we have a concern with Egypt that's closed off the Straits of Tehran, we have to deal with that, but if you don't attack us, uh, we are not going to attack you and the Jordanians. When the war started, it was the Jordanian Legion that uh, attacked Israel, also attacked uh, West Jerusalem. And during the defensive actions of the Israeli army, at a certain time, there was an understanding that if we need to fight to defeat the, the, the Jordanian troops, we have to take over the old city of Jerusalem. With Egypt in the south, Jordan in the east, and Syria in the north, Israel was fighting on three fronts. This was the plan of the Arab nations, in which they expected to wipe out Israel in a matter of hours. Yet in six days, Israel managed to not only defeat the Arab nations, but also gain valuable and strategic territory. From Egypt, the Sinai Desert. From Syria the Golan Heights from which Syria had launched countless attacks on Jewish fishermen and farmers for 19 years. And from Jordan, the West Bank and Jerusalem. This would be the first time Israel would have access to the most holy sites for Jews, the Western Wall. So it was basically a military action, but what it brought is a uh, such a strong homecoming feeling and there are very famous uh, pictures of you know very tough soldiers after long days of fighting just standing there religious non-religious and just crying because we came back to uh, our birthplace as a nation so in that sense there are no words to describe how important it was for uh, the Jewish people and for the state of Israel when we came back to the place where we were born as a nation, uh, to the Western Wall and to the Temple Mount.
With the defeat of the Egyptians, Jordanians, and Syrians, Israel had now gained control of a much larger territory and much larger problems. With the retreat of Egypt and Jordan, Israel was now responsible for both the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. The Six-Day War is a complicated war from many perspectives. From uh, an international law perspective, it seems to me clear enough that the Egyptians closed the Straits of Tehran, which is an act of war against, uh, against Israel. And if Israel was the first to start bombing, it was responding to another act of war. We have to remember that in 1967, in June of 1967, the Arab states attacked Israel. It was a concerted effort. Israel fought back, and by some a whole series of miracles, Israel actually not only defeated the enemies, but was able to retake territory that had not been Israeli territory. Israel did extend an olive branch at the end of that war and uh, offered to give back all the territories uh, right away. In fact, Israel would reach a peace deal with Egypt, returning the Sinai Desert. Anwar Sadat, the Egyptian president who agreed to peace and the recognition of Israel, was assassinated not long after by radical Muslims. Israel did not want to be domin dominating over, over other countries. It's not, it's not what Israel was about. It was not the political or the ideological. Uh, aim of the country, but it found itself in this in this in this situation. And when it did try to have discussions with with uh, with other countries about how to deal with this land, how to how to set up a, 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 basically a two-state solution, basically a territory side by side, it was either met with, with with lack of interest or with terror or with war. There was just a no from the uh, Arab world, no negotiation, no peace, uh, no recognition. Whether the three no's of the uh, uh, of the Arab world uh, after the after the Six Day War, uh, very sad. All of the settlements, all of the settlements, are illegal under international law. And Israel has over 200 settlements on Palestinian territory, all fortified that Israel has over 500 checkpoints <clears throat> in Palestine where the Palestinians can't move from one place to another. Those are occupied Palestinian territories. Israel now controlled the West Bank, Gaza, all of Jerusalem, and the Golan Heights. With Egypt and Jordan not wanting the West Bank and Gaza returned, some Israelis saw this as an opportunity to settle in what many call occupied territories. What, what people call the occupied territories, I like to say, are disputed territories. There is no doubt that there is an argument to be made by both sides as to who that land belongs to. But just as when you're dealing with borders that you don't agree with, the answer is negotiations, the answer is, is meetings, is treaties, the answer is not to strap a suicide to bomb to your waist and go and blow up civilians in a public square. Terror. Although it has been used against the Jewish nation since before their rebirth, notably since the 1920s, Israel and the world had never witnessed such intense and horrifying attacks on civilians in what is called the Intifadas. In 2000, not far from here, the second intifada began, which was a violent uprising against uh, Israel by Palestinians, which primarily used the tool of suicide bombings. Since the year 2000, um, there have been uh, more than a thousand Israeli civilians killed in terror attacks. There was, uh, as, 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 as effective as Israel was in, uh, with its intelligence and, and, and in, in stopping many attacks before they, they happened, uh, it was just, it was, the situation was untenable. I mean, in, 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 the, in the worst, in the height of the terror war, there, there would be three, four, five terror attacks a week. Uh, it, the whole country was, li was living in fear. Ya man sahirti min ajli rahati 
ها أنا اليوم أضحي بنفسي لكي أشفع لك يا حبيبتي ويا مهجتي كفكفي دموعك لا تحزني فوالله لقد نلت أقصى ما كنت أتمنى ما لي أراك حزينة يوم The absence of any cessation of the kind of incitement that we see in the kind of hatred um, Israel had to take a practical solution which was if the terrorists can't get into the country they can't blow up innocent civilians. Israel's response to the waves of attacks against their people was to build the controversial barrier between them and the terrorists. There's a wall being built uh, completely surrounding uh, Gaza, completely surrounding Bethlehem and other substantial sized cities, deeply intruding into Palestinian territory and uh, encompassing more and more land for the Israelis to take away from Palestine. The security fence has one purpose and one purpose only, and that's to stop terror attacks. And in that, it has been very, very successful. The attempts that we have had now have been in the areas where the security fence has not yet been completed, and it simply saves lives. It's not pretty in many places, although I should point out that it is 96% fence and it's only 4% wall, although, of course, it's the wall that you usually see on television. Israel never built this wall. Israel was never want to build this wall. If there is anybody build this wall, is the Palestinians themselves, and Hamas and the terrorist attacks. It is not an ideal solution. Uh, again, I don't think that that anyone would have said, "Oh, gee, I'm really looking forward to the day that we have to build a security barrier down the middle of our down the middle of our of our country." But it is a practical response. To, to a very real situation and the fact is that since the, be that since the, the security barrier which is mostly a fence, it's, it's only a wall in a very very small part of the country, uh, terror attacks have been way down. The effectiveness of the security barrier is evidenced in this video of Ramadan Shalah, head of the Palestinian Islamic Jihad on the Hezbollah television station Al Manar. <laughs> داخل الضفة الغربية هناك مثلا الجدار الفاصل الذي شكل عائق في وجه المقاومة وإلا كان الوضع مختلف تماما. They allow the Palestinians to cross the borders in the time that there was a peace. They allow, they give them jobs. They, 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 they allow the people to cross as they please for their economic, for, for teaching, for water, for food, for whatever reason. But when you keep attacking Israel, and you keep, keep killing the civilians and the children and, 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 and women in the buses and, 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 and in restaurants and in the coffee shops. What do you want from Israel as a state to do to protect themselves? They need to put this wall for security. But does Israel build this wall? Is the Palestinians, terrorists and the extremists and the Hamas leadership. They are the one who built this wall. It was not Israel. Maybe it was built by Israeli hand, but it was built by Palestinian will. The word apartheid is, uh, is exactly accurate. You know, this is uh, an, an area that's occupied by two powers. Uh, they're now completely separated. The Palestinians can't even ride on the same roads that the Israelis have created or built in Palestinian territory. Uh, they, they, the Israelis uh, never see a Palestinian except their is, Israeli soldiers. The Palestinians never see an Israeli except at a distance, except the Israeli soldiers. So within Palestinian territory, they're absolutely and totally separated, much worse than they were in South Africa, by the way. And the other thing is, the other definition of apartheid is one side dominates the other, and the Israelis completely dominate the life um, of the Palestinian people. The canard that uh, Israel's security barrier is somehow, uh, the term used, batted around is apartheid wall, as if apartheid, under which millions of, of black South Africans suffered, a real regime denying them fundamental human rights and civil rights, as if there's any kind of way that you can look at Israel as a democracy which gives full rights to its Arab, Muslim, Christian and other minorities in its country and which has encouraged more freedoms to the Palestinians under our jurisdiction since 1967, freedom of, of uh, the press, freedom of religion, women's rights, the idea that the 
that this epithet, apartheid, has any application to Israel, whether Israel proper and our Muslim uh, and Arab minority and or our treatment of the Palestinians is, is, is preposterous. Let's be intellectually honest in our use of language. Apartheid was one thing. You want to argue with me as to whether or not building the security barrier was the correct policy response by Israel to the scourge of terror attacks? You want to say to me that you think it was unjustified or that it's not effective? You can say that. Reasonable people can disagree. I will argue that it's actually the most effective and the policy which causes the least damage to the Palestinian population than any other policy. But to suggest that Israel's policies in the terrorists are imperialist or colonialist or racist or to use terms like apartheid or collective punishment that it's just not justified based on the facts on the ground. One man would refine terror tactics and make terrorist a household word. Yasser Arafat. Before uh, Arafat came along, there was a generation of, of Palestinians who knew what it was like to live side by side with Israel in peace. Again, the circumstances may not have been ideal, they may not have, they, they, they've always wanted a, a separate state, but at least there was not the hatred. There was more of a sense of, of cooperation. What Arafat began was it was a real culture of hate in which an entire generation has been brainwashed to believe that Israel has no right to exist, that, um, that all of Israel is, is Palestinian land, and more importantly for the young people, that their goal should be to be martyrs, shaheeds for Allah. They should grow up and use violence as a means to get what they want. Sayyidi Rais, what is the message that you want to send to the people of the Palestinians in a general way and the children of the Palestinians in a general way? This is the child who is holding the hammer and holding the baby. مش أكبر رسالة للعالم وبيستشهد هذا البطل إحنا فخورين بين He himself was born in Egypt was a student activist there before he then moved to Judea Samaria when it was under Jordanian territory when it was under Jordan he moved to the West Bank and there he initiated terror terror attacks against Israel uh, again, with the open, open, declared goal of destroying Israel and replacing it with what he claimed was a Palestinian nation. هذه هي المنة التي منا الله عليكم يا أشبال يا زهرات فلسطين أنتم الأمل أنتم فعلا زي ما قال أخي قبل قليل إن شبلا من أشبالنا وظهرة من زهراتنا سيرفعان عاجلا أم آجلا the total destruction of the Jewish state of Israel was the goal of Arafat and all who followed him. The indoctrination of hate and incitement of violence fueled his movement known as the PLO, known now today as the Fatah. Nani Darwish knows too well the circumstances surrounding the conflict, having lived in Gaza as a little girl, before her father, an Egyptian army commander, was assassinated by Israel and later replaced by Yasser Arafat. He was installed a couple of years after my father died in Gaza, and he was installed to start the jihad against Israel by the Arab world. He became a partner with all the Arab leaders. He was the puppet of the Arab world. He was not making policy. He was taking orders from 22 
Arab countries who made him a hero of jihad. One of Arafat's more sinister and effective strategies was to claim the name Palestinian and re-educate his people to believe that the Jews had never existed in the land. One of the things that's very important for the Palestinians is to give themselves a history. Uh, the Jewish history in the land of Israel is well known for thousands of years and it's completely documented for thousands of years. Um, Arabs only arrived in the region in the 7th century and, and Palestinians, uh, as is the Arabs who, who are in Judea and Samaria today, um, are really very, very recent arrivals. A century ago, the country had essentially a few hundred thousand uh, Arabs and if you look at them today and look at their history today most of the of the people who call themselves Palestinians today came from Syria uh, from Lebanon area um, and from Egypt area but it's important for them to create this Palestinian myth in order to give themselves a history and the way they do this is they take all of Jewish history and they put academics professors on television who say that wasn't really Jewish history, it was really Muslim and Arab history. You have, for example, the chairman of the Palestinian Public Library who, who says that the Hebrews of the Bible were Arabs and the Hebrews of the Bible were Muslims. And therefore, what he's done is he erases Jewish connection to the land and he turns the whole history of the Bible into Arab and therefore Palestinian history. It's, of course, ridiculous from any academic or any historical perspective, but they have been doing this over and over and over again, pretending that they have a few thousand year old history in the land uh, by stealing Jewish history and claiming it's their own. As Arab children, for example, I was told just like all Arab children that Jerusalem is a Muslim city and, and foreigners, Jews are foreigners who came and occupied. They never told us that to the Jews, Jerusalem is like Mecca to the Muslims. To the Christians, Bethlehem and Jerusalem is like Mecca and Medina to the Muslims. And, uh, and this is a fact that unfortunately many Arabs don't want to accept. They want to deny the Jewish people of their holy land. أن هناك رؤية لأن يكون مكانها قدس الأقداس في الهيكل المزعوم وهو مجرد وهم بالمناسبة لا يوجد له أي أثر لا في أطريات ولا في وأسطورة رواية ليس لها قيمة مثل ألف ليلة وليلة ومثل القصص الغابرة في الزير سالم إلى آخره إلا في فلسطين ستون عاما من الحفريات وخاب ظنهم فلم يجدوا شيئا لا إبريقا لا عملا لا فخارية لا برونزية لا قطع معدنية لا شيء على إطلاق من هذه الأسطورة لأنها أسطورة وكاذبة نقول أن هذه الحفريات لم تبقي متر واحد ولكنها لم لم تنتج شيئا على الإطلاق ولذلك هذه الأسطورة هذا الهيكل المزعوم أريد أن يكون مكان مسجد قبة الصخرة because of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict the Arabs have got the tendency to deny, to deny uh, the fact that Israel was there. I know that there are places where there are places of Islam and Muslim. I don't know if there are places of Jewish. At the very center of the conflict is the Temple Mount, home of the Jewish holy site, the Western Wall. As well as the Dome of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa Mosque making this the third holiest site in Islam after Mecca and Medina. History records that 2,000 years ago, Herod the Great rebuilt Solomon's temple on this site for the Jewish people he ruled. This is known as the Second Temple. 
The temple was destroyed by the Romans following the Jewish rebellion in the year 70 of the Common Era. History also records that nearly 700 years later, Muslim conquerors captured Jerusalem and built the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Dome of the Rock on the ruins of the Jewish temple. Yet because of the Palestinian myth, many people now believe that the Jewish temple, neither Solomon's nor Herod's ever existed. بدأت بحفريات منذ عام 67 للبحث عن آثار لهيكلهم أو لتاريخهم اليهودي المزعوم. There is discussion today about the Temple Mount, and the Muslims claim that there was no temple there; that they were the first to build the building there. We still have Herodian walls all around. Herod the Great. A master builder made sure that people would know his work. He had the temple built with large stones with a distinctive beveled edge. This can easily be seen around the Temple Mount today. حوالات حقيقية من الدولة الإسرائيلية لإظهار أن الإسرائيليين عاشوا ولهم أثر في فلسطين ولكن ليس دائما هذا يأتي لهم وبالتالي يقومون بعملية التزوير انظري معي إلى ما تم الادعاء ادعاءه تحت الحرم بوجود هيكل حقيقة أن هذا ليس هيكلا وعلماء الأثار الزملاء الإسرائيليين يقولون ذلك أن هذا ليس Unfortunately, we have today a group of archaeologists, historians from other countries, in Denmark, in England, very typical England, who deny this come with the same story that we falsify the history of the country, that we always do, you know, Israeli Jewish archaeology of the country. What can I do if the Muslims came only in the 7th century? And for them the country was not central, so they did not build much. Because if we speak about it, I'd like to say that our Jewish contribution to the Islamic archaeology of the country is exceeding everybody else before. Especially when it comes to, to the Second Temple time, uh, with uh, Jewish inscriptions uh, on the rock, on stones, and, and, uh, and, and literature like in Qumran, I mean, uh, I, there is not even a smallest evidence. <laughs> it's so clear cut. إنما يزعمونه بأن الأقصى مقام على أنقاض هيكل سليمان لا دلال له وهو بعيد كل البعد عن الحقيقة والحقيقة تقول. بأن الله عز وجل حينما قرر أن يكون هنا الأقصى لا يمكن أن يكون قبله معبد لغير المسلمين هو حقد وحسد يحسدوننا لوجود الأقصى في أرضنا فهم يريدون it is below my dignity even to discuss it because I want them to tell me how come there are inscriptions which forbid the Gentile from trespassing when we've got the Hindu Hebrew inscriptions saying the place of trumpeting when we've got all fragments of writings when we find Jewish coins we find uh, we find the Herodian arrangement uh, I mean master plan of Jerusalem there when we found ritual Jewish ritual bath I want them to explain it Way back in biblical times, the Jews who lived in the land of Israel and who called the place where they lived Canaan, before the, uh, before the Jews arrived there uh, 3,000 uh, 3, years ago, or a little more than 3,000 years ago. And it seems that for a while people continued, and some people continued to call it Canaan, even after the Jewish arrival, and other people called it the land of Israel. Uh, However, there was a pretender to control of the land of Israel, the Philistines, a sea people who had uh, come from Europe and had settled uh, near the area of uh, Gaza right now in, like, like the city of Gaza, uh, which is a source of some problems for the modern uh, state of Israel. The Jews living in the land of Israel 
uh, almost 3,000 years ago had problems with the sea people who called themselves the uh, Philistines. And wars went on between the Philistines and, uh, and the Israelites for a number of uh, centuries. The common historical explanation is that when the Romans became so angry about the behavior of the Judeans who kept re rebelling against their control. The Romans ruled much of the known world and had little tolerance for rebellions. The Jews grew tired of Romans and fiercely resented Roman control and influence, especially when it affected their religion. After the second Jewish rebellion led by Bar Kokhba, the Emperor Hadrian decided that removing Jews from their land physically and spiritually was the best way to avoid future rebellions and at the same time completely humiliate them. Renaming the land Philistia or Palestina after their ancient dreaded foes from the Old Testament the Philistines was to further shame the Jewish survivors and remove any trace of their claim to the land. There weren't any Philistines alive in the second century when the Romans started calling it Palestine, but they just did not want to recognize. It's the first uh, action of non-recognition of the Jewish connection to the land of Israel was the attachment of the name Palestine to the land. Now, as the years went on, people started forgetting about what the origin of that name Palestine was, and it became a name for that geographical unit. For 1,800 years, the world's Palestinians were Jews, acknowledged by everyone. This we're talking about from, uh, from 125 uh, of the Common Era after uh, the name of, 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 of Israel was changed to Palestine as a, by the Romans with the goal of uh, cutting off the Jewish identity of the land. They went and they named it Palestine. But the Palestinians from then on were the Jews. For example, you have dozens and dozens of posters from the uh, Jewish posters, Zionist posters, all referring to themselves as Palestinians. This is in the pre-state of Israel era. And Arabs weren't defining themselves as Palestinians. You've got the Palestine Post, which is now the Jerusalem Post. You had the Palestine Patas organization. Uh, you had the um, Palestine Bank. These are all Zionist, Jewish, uh, Palestinian uh, uh, institutions. And it was only when we became a state in 1948 and dropped our name Palestinians uh, that you then had the great identity theft. You had uh, Arafat come in and they said, oh, if we would steal their identity as Palestinians, adopt it as our own, and then uh, we not only steal their identity, but we can steal their history as well. This was their great plan, and unfortunately, the world has been very willing to accept this uh, ridiculous historical narrative. If we want to talk about the Jews, the Quran, the Quran, قال عنهم ذلك بأنهم لا يفقهون ولا يعقلون ولا يعلمون وينقضون العهود وما شابه ذلك ولكن يحد اليهود اشتهروا أو اشتهر عنهم عبر التاريخ أنهم يحرفوا ادعاءات كذب وزور وبهتان افتراءات لتبرير العدوان باغتصاب الأرض انتهاك المقدسات تدنيس الحرمات مصادرة الأراضي هدم البيوت قتل الأطفال والنساء والشيوخ I believe that the PA media contribute to the conflict a great deal لا تقوم الساعة حتى يقاتل المسلمون اليهود فيقتلهم المسلمون The Arab media uh, such as Al Jazeera or Al, Al Quds or the Palestinian uh, news in general or the Arabic news, Muslim news in general it will make the matter worse. Using the media to vilify Israel has been an effective tactic since the beginning. However, Yasser Arafat would take it to new heights. After his death, leadership of the Palestinian Authority would remain with his party, Fatah, and its leader, Mahmoud Abbas. <laughs> احنا بنقول دولة اسرائيل سموا حالكم انتوا اللي بدكم اياه ما انا بقبلش وهي بحكي على الهواء هلا مش 
this is this is a fairly closed society. There are three daily newspapers uh, controlled to some extent or another by the Palestinian Authority. There is an official Palestinian Authority television station controlled uh, under the office through the office of Mahmoud Abbas. Every thing in the Arab media is controlled by the governments uh, 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 from where this Arab media is coming from. Everything is controlled by the government, controlled by the authority. And nothing will be said in this news, in this Arabic news, without the approval of their governments. The Quran of Mecca, in its nature, did not refer to the Jews. We find a picture in its entirety, a picture of Mecca, a picture of the name يعني اليهود أو بني إسرائيل هذا أمر غريب والأغرب منه أنها جاءت تتكلم عن اليهود ليس يهود بني قينقاع وبني النضير ويهود بني قريضة وخيبر وإنما جاءت تتكلم عن يهود هذا العصر يهود هذا القرن وليست بأية لغة إنما بلغة إعلان الفناء بلغة حفر القبر بلغة يعني يعني لاحظ أن سورة الإسراء حكمت بالفناء على اليهود قبل أن يكون يهودي واحد على هذه الأرض سورة الإسراء أعلنت عن عن انهيار ما يعرف بدولة إسرائيل قبل أن تقوم هذه الدولة هنا ستحل البركة الحقيقية على بالقضاء على يهود هنا في فلسطين هذا من أروع ألوان البركة الحقيقية لفلسطين. There are no surprises in the Palestinian Authority media. Mahmoud Abbas does not open his paper at breakfast and say, "Oh my gosh, they're inciting against the Jews today." تعالوا بنا لنقدم السلام. لشعبنا الصامد في غزة الذين يقفون دفاعا عن الوطن وعروبة القدس وعن فلسطين من النهر إلى البحر ومن الناقورة حتى رفح هذه أرضنا والكلاب يجب عليهم أن يرحلوا منها There is no such thing as an independent media in the Palestinian Authority. There have been efforts to establish uh, independent media outlets and they have not been allowed to, to blossom. You have music videos, you have music videos running on Palestinian television this year which sing about the destruction of Israel. You have music videos uh, running on Palestinian television this year which are pure hate videos, talk about the enemy Israel. In fact, one of them is named my enemy. thing is talking about Israel as a snake coiled around the land uh, and this one probably was on two three hundred times this year on Palestinian television and this is all during a period when supposedly we're in the process in the peace process this is all post Annapolis uh, supposedly Abbas has said okay we accept Israel's right and yet they're singing about the conquering of Israel and they and they name every city <laughs> Uh, Akko, uh, they mention, they make it clear that they're talking about conquering all of Israel. Recently, a very senior uh, Palestinian cleric talked about the Zionists going and slashing open the bellies of pregnant, uh, pregnant Arab women to, to, to pull out the fetuses. <laughs> Last summer we had uh, a report in several of the Palestinian newspapers about Israel releasing a special breed of rat that uh, it, into, into the old city to, to chase away the Palestinians. This rat um, was four times bigger than a, than a normal rat. Cats were, cats, it actually chased cats. It, uh, it had uh, up to 140 babies a year. And it, 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 it was so specialized that it only chased uh, uh, Arabs and Muslims, not Jews, and that it was destroying the city. I mean, these seem, these seem quite ridiculous to us, except that you have to understand that it is part of, if you've been learning this kind of thing for 10 years, 15 years, even five years, uh, then you, you believe that there's a monster on the, other, on the other side of the border who is out to destroy you.
لا عمري كاني ارى مصرعي ولكني اسرع اليه خطى لا عمري كهذا ممات الرجال ومن رام موت الفداء فدا فكيف اصطباري لكيد اليهود تبدا من الزيكا يا شهيد انت ليش بتعملوا هيك مثلا؟ هيك عشان ايش؟ عشان اليهود عشان اليهود ليش هم يطخوا علينا؟ حيوانين the hate-filled media in the Arab world is most disturbing when seeing the effect it has on the children. These children are poisoned. They are given no choice. They're, they're given no choice to accept Israel as a neighbor. They're taught that, uh, that their religion, that Islam, demands the destruction of Israel. And this, by the way, in their school books as well. Palestinian school books define the conflict with Israel not only as nationalistic, but as a ribat. They say, you have to, have to, must destroy Israel for Islam because Israel is on Islamic land. And, and therefore you have a religious imperative, and the school books say that this ribat, this war against Israel, will continue until resurrection. Not until there's a peace treaty, not until there's negotiations. This is an eternal war for the destruction of Israel. This is the message that children are being brought up on. Teaching of hate of Jews is, is not only happening in the Gaza and the West Bank. Today it's happening in Iran. There are so thousands of Iranian children now learning textbooks about uh, hating Jews, uh, wanting to destroy Israel. Ahmadinejad is teaching Iranian little children the same things that I was taught in Gaza as a child. This is not uh, just uh, an Arab problem, this is a Muslim world problem. By all means, uh, the people in the street, uh, the media, uh, the, the, the school systems, even the school books in Egypt, even now, today, in 2009, uh, condemning Israel and attacking Israel, and to be honest with you, I believe it's a brainwash. وبالتالي كان تفكيرهم فقط هو انهم يطلعوا على الخارج ويرموا حجر على الجند الاسرائيلي وانهم يحصلوا على الشهاده يعني تفكيرهم كان نيتهم اصبحت انهم يتمنوا يحصلوا على الشهاده في المقام الاول عندهم. فمفهوم الشهاده له امتناء لوطنه من ناحيه عقيده دينيه عم تضحي من اجل وطنه في سبيل انه الحصول على الشهاده والوصول للجنه وملاقات ربي وهذا هذا احسن احسن شيء احنا عم بنربي كمان اطفالنا للمحافظه على الوطن والانتماء للوطن والوصول للشهاده فور اكزامبل هير از ا بوك فور 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 2008 ذس از ان اكشن بوك فروم فروم ذا ايجيبشن هيستوري ايديوكيشن اند اند هير از ا ماب of the Middle East. And here is a country, we are talking about country that had a peace with Israel for over 25 years. And here is a map of, of the Middle East, and there is no Israel exists on the map. It's only the Palestinian state. There is no Israel exists in the map. Uh, if, uh, and this is in, in, in page number two. If we moved a little bit to page number 24, you found here the problem of the Palestinian state. And here we'll tell you about the wars and we'll tell you about uh, uh, that even though that there is a peace agreement, we supposed to continue the jihad. And here is a country that had a peace with Israel for over 25 years. So you tell me if this is right or wrong. We must stop the propaganda to which Palestinian children are being exposed. These children deserve an education that instills respect for life and peace instead of glorifying death and violence. Hillary Clinton at a press conference uh, with the Palestinian Media Watch in the Senate uh, last year 
spoke out and totally, totally condemned this. She called this education profoundly poisoning the minds of Palestinian children. And I agree with her completely. That must be a priority for all people who care about children, who care about the kind of peace, stability, safety, and security that Israel deserves to be guaranteed. Hamas is definitely a terrorist organization. If you read the Hamas charter, it is very specifically dedicated to, uh, to, to the destruction of Israel, to the belief that all of what we know is Israel and the Palestinian territories, that it is all Islamic waqf, which is Islamic trust. It cannot be divided by man. It cannot be negotiated. <laughs> so there's no such thing for Hamas as 1967 borders, 1948 borders, because it all belongs to God. Men are, uh, are only uh, safeguarding it, the caretakers, and it must all belong to, uh, it must all be under the rule of Islam. Hamas will do whatever it takes to, to destroy Israel, annihilate Israel. They will make deals with the devil. They will make deals with Iran. They will make deals with the Muslim Brotherhood. We should never ac accept Hamas as a legitimate uh, official a respectable government. They are terrorists, and not only that, they want to destroy Israel and replace it with an Islamist state. From the time they are born, Palestinian children are taught to hate the Jews and become martyrs, shaheeds for Allah. They think that they are hurting the enemy with the constant jihad, the hate speech, and the violence, and uh, training their kids to become uh, suicide bombers. والحمد لله رب العالمين برفع راسي وقل الفخر والاعتزاز اللي ابن شهيد ومش شهيد ابن بس كلهم أولادي كل الشهداء أولادي والحمد لله قل الفخر والاعتزاز أولادي كلهم السبعة أنا مجد معهم للجد فدى الجد فدى الجد فدى الجد I believe that this is hurting Arab culture and Muslim culture even more than they're hurting Israel.
The conflict is further complicated by the various factions within the Palestinians and within Islam itself. In 2007, the Hamas violently overthrew the Fatah in the Gaza Strip, believing that Arafat's replacement Mahmoud Abbas and the Fatah party had grown too weak to continue jihad against the Jews. For the first time, the world witnessed just how brutal and merciless Hamas is as they slaughtered their own people for such crimes as supporting Fatah or even just playing music. If you notice, when Hamas and Fatah were fighting each other, killing each other, Hamas killed, <coughs> Hamas killed brutally. So many Muslim men in Gaza, brutally, because they didn't, uh, they are not Hamas members, they didn't do what they were told. Israel never killed as many and with such brutality and barbarity the way they were killed. I'm sure many of us saw these footage of killing men, blowing up the heads of men, decapitating them, uh, cutting their legs. Uh, uh, it is uh, it's, it's brutal. Nobody talks about it because it's Arab on Arab brutality. Israel as a land was never the conflict. The main conflict here is the very existence of the Jewish people, of the Jewish soul on the Israeli land. فأنتم لم تعادوا اليهود لأنهم مجرد بشر يأكلون ويشربون لا وإنما نحن نعاديهم لأنهم أعداء لله in a way, you might say the question of anti-Semitism and the Jewish-Arab conflict is a chicken and egg conflict. Um, is there a conflict because there are some innate anti-Semitic attitudes within Islam and that's why they can't tolerate the presence of a Jewish state among them? Or would you say that there's a political conflict, that is, there's a piece of territory that's being fought over and because the Jews are holding on to a territory that the Arab culture desires, the Palestinian desires, that generates anti-Semitic feelings. It's, it's really hard to parse that, right? It's, it's really the classic chicken and egg conflict. But certainly the net result is that the argument gets framed in anti-Semitic terms. <laughs> People are buying children, women, elderly. I don't know what asking we can do. A lot of the critics of Israel are really genuine. They really believe in what they're saying. They believe that if we just give them a piece of land here, just move out of Gaza, move back to the borders of pre-67 war, they are 
They sincerely believe it. I don't believe it because I lived in Gaza before the 67 war and my father was killed in the conflict and the jihad against Israel. And that also all happened before the 67 war and before the occupation of the West Bank and Gaza. There are many in, uh, in Islamic tradition who believe that just like uh, Muhammad uh, fought against uh, three powerful Jewish tribes in Medina and when he defeated them he was then able to go out and conquer the rest of the world there are many uh, in Islamic thought who believe that once Israel is destroyed that will be the gateway for Islam to conquer the rest of the world so that many uh, in the Islamic world target Israel in particular because they feel that is the that's the cork in their uh, in their bottle and once that's free uh, that the rest of the world is theirs <laughs> ستفتح روما كما فتحت القسطنطينية ببشارة نبينا محمد ستكون عاصمتهم نقطة متقدمة للفتوحات الإسلامية التي تنساح في أوروبا كلها ثم تلتفت إلى الأمريكتين بل إلى أوروبا الشرقية to prove the Arab-Israeli conflict is not uh, a conflict over a piece of land. I mean, look at, at Ahmadinejad. Ahmadinejad is not even Arab. He's just a Muslim. In a world America and without the Soviet Union, it is impossible to and not just he has taken it upon himself to rid the, the area of Jews. Why is that? Because it's intrinsic in Muslim scriptures to want to kill Jews wherever you find them. <laughs> There are daily shows in the Arab world. They're saying it from the pulpits of mosques. They're saying it with full force on Arab TV every day. يا الله يا الله احصل احصل يهود عددا واقتلهم بددا ولا تغادر منهم احدا They want to annihilate the Jews they want to conquer the world they say we want to take over Rome we want to take over UK we want to take over uh, United States so they are not hiding it if the west doesn't want to know it it's not because the arabs are, are hiding it the west is in denial as well. If there's one thing that demonstrates the strength of Israel and the reason why in the war against those who wants to destroy us, we will win. If, there one, if there's one thing that proves that is that we believe in life and in peace, but we're prepared to die for it. While the other side believe only in death. أصبح الموت عند الشعب الفلسطيني صناعة تجيده النساء تجيده كل من في هذه الأرض يجيده الشيوخ يجيده المجاهدون ويجيده الأطفال لذلك شكلوا دروعا بشرية من النساء والأطفال والشيوخ والمجاهدين ليتحدوا بذلك آلة القصف الصهيونية وكأنهم يقولون للعدو الصهيوني إننا نحرص على الموت كما تحرصون على الحياة
you need to understand that in in our media in our teaching you know they they present them they, they eat children and they drink their blood the palestinian children they, they kill children and and when i walked in the street i found them a human being i did not found them angels i did not found them evil i just found them a human being all they want and all their dreams is just to exist is just to live in peace with their neighbors they just want to go to coffee shop they want to go to work they want to live they want to love but the reality and the fact here is that their dreams become a nightmare is actually become worse than the nightmare because you can wake up from nightmare but you cannot wake up from a sea of enemy who want to finish you The Arab states must recognize that the Arab Peace Initiative was an important beginning, but not the end of their responsibilities. The Arab-Israeli conflict should no longer be used to distract the people of Arab nations from other problems. Instead, it must be a cause for action to help the Palestinian people develop the institutions that will sustain their state, to recognize Israel's legitimacy, and to choose progress over a self-defeating focus on the past. The progress of the Arab world will not happen, will not happen until the Arab-Israeli conflict is over. We care about having peace in the future, but we know that we can never have peace with a Palestinian generation that's brought up believing that they have to destroy Israel. The way the Islam is taught today, the way the Arab world media is behaving today, and the way mosques are operating today, it's almost impossible to reach peace between Arabs and Jews. That doesn't mean I don't have hope. The only way we will have peace is if we eliminate those impediments to peace. Now there is no greater impediment to peace than teaching Palestinian children that they have to destroy Israel because God wants it. There is no greater impediment to peace than showing Palestinian children tanks killing them, helicopters killing them, all contrived, all made up, because those children grew up with a passionate, passionate hatred of Israel. I think the thing we need to focus on and that, that, that is essential before any kind of final peace deal, before even an interim uh, peace deal, we need to focus on, on peace education replacing hate education. I'm speaking because I love my people. Arab kids don't need jihad. They need jobs. Arab kids don't need hatred. They need hope. They need education. They need to look at other people of different religions as an opportunity to learn something from others, not an opportunity to kill others. If you want to compete with Israel, you can do it. Compete in the educational field, in the innovation field. Let's not compete with the Jews in the killing fields. As everyone who's serious about peace understands that unless the Palestinians change the way their people are being taught and brought up, there is no chance for peace in the next generation. We're not saying don't negotiate. We're not saying the Palestinians are not entitled to land. We're not saying they're not entitled to a state. We're saying that the first step is peace education because only with peace education will we have peace. If Muslims are really sincere about, about peace with the Jews, they must make a fatwa by the top leaders of Islam, whether it's in Saudi Arabia, in Egypt, in Iran, in, um, in all the Muslim world. They must issue a fatwa saying that any reference to killing Jews or calling them apes and pigs does not apply today to the Jews of today. It only applies to the seventh century. If that fatwa is issued, the Arab-Israeli conflict will be solved. In all the Muslim world, they must issue a fatwa saying that any reference to killing Jews or calling them apes and pigs does not apply today.
to the Jews of today. It only applies to the seventh century. If that fatwa is issued, the Arab-Israeli conflict will be solved. And I say to the Palestinians this evening, we want to live with you in peace as good neighbors. We want our children and your children to never again experience war, that parents, wives, husbands, brothers and sisters will never again know the agony of losing a loved one in battle, that our children will be able to dream of a better future and realize that dream, that together we will invest our energies in plowshares and pruning hooks, not swords and spears.